Book Four, Chapter One of the Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Four, containing the interval of about one year. From the siege of Gamala to the coming of Titus to besiege Jerusalem. Chapter One the siege and taking of Gamala. 1. Now all those Galileans who, after the taking of Jotapata, had revolted from the Romans, did, upon the conquest of Terrake, deliver themselves up to them again. And the Romans received all the fortresses and the cities, excepting Gizcala and those that had seized upon Mount Tabor. Gamala also, which is a city ever against Terrakem, but on the other side of the lake, conspired with them. This city lay upon the borders of Agrippa's kingdom, as also did Sogana and Seleucia. And these were both parts of Gaulonitis, for Sogana was part of that called the Upper Gaulonitis, as was Gamala of the Lower, while Seleucia was situated at the lake Semacauitis, which lake is thirty furlongs in breadth and sixty in length. Its marshes reach as far as the place Daphne, which in other respects is a delicious place, and hath such fountains as supply water to what is called Little Jordan, under the temple of the Golden Calf, where it is sent into the Great Jordan. Footnote. Here we have the exact situation of Jeroboam's at the exit of the Little Jordan into the Great Jordan, near the place called Daphne, but of old Dan. But Reland suspects Flint here we should read Dan instead of there being nowhere else mentioned of a place called Daphne. And footnote. Now Agrippa had united Sogana and Seleucia by leagues to himself at the very beginning of the revolt of the Romans. Yet did not Gamala accede to them, but relied upon the difficulty of the place, which was greater than that of Jodapada, for it was situated upon a rough ridge of the high mountain, with a kind of neck in the middle, where it begins to ascend, it lengthens itself, and declines as much downward before as behind, insomuch that it is like a camel in figure, from whence it is so named, although the people of the country do not pronounce it accurately. Both on the side and the face there are abrupt parts divided from the rest, and ending in vast deep valleys. Yet are the parts behind, where they are joined to the mountain, somewhat easier of ascent than the other, but then the people belonging to the place have cut an oblique ditch there, and made that hard to be ascended also. On its acclivity, which is straight, houses are built, and those very thick and close to one another. The city also hangs so strangely, that it looks as if it would fall down upon itself, so sharp is it at the top. It is exposed to the south, and its southern mount, which reaches to an immense height, was in the nature of a citadel to the city, and above that was a precipice, not walled about, but extending itself to an immense depth. There was also a spring of water within the wall, at the utmost limits of the city. 2. As this city was naturally hard to be taken, so had Josephus, by building a wall about it, made it still stronger, as also by ditches and mines underground. The people that were in it were made more bold by the nature of the place than the people of Jodapata had been, but it had much fewer fighting men in it, and they had such a confidence in the situation of the place that they thought the enemy could not be too many for them, for the city had been filled with those that had fled to it for safety, on account of its strength, on which account they had been able to resist those whom Agrippa sent to besiege it for seven months together. 3. But Vespasian removed from Emmaus, where he had last pitched his camp before the city Tiberias, now Emmaus, if it may be interpreted, may be rendered a warm bath, for therein is a spring of warm water useful for healing, and came to Gamala, yet was its situation such that he was not able to encompass it all around with soldiers to watch it, but where the places were practicable, he set men to watch it, and seized upon the mountain which was over it. And as the legions, according to their usual custom, were fortifying their camp upon that mountain, he began to cast up banks at the bottom, at the part towards the east, where the highest tower of the whole city was, and where the fifteenth legion pitched their camp while the fifth legion did duty over against the midst of the city, and whilst the tenth legion filled up the ditches in the valleys. Now at this time it was that as King Agrippa was come nigh the walls, 
and was endeavoring to speak to those that were on the walls about a surrender, he was hit with a stone on his right elbow by one of the slingers. He was then immediately surrounded with his own men. But the Romans were excited to set about the siege by their indignation on the king's account, and by their fear on their own account, as concluding that those men would omit no kinds of barbarity against foreigners and enemies, who were so enraged against one of their own nation, and one that advised them to nothing but what was for their own advantage. 4. Now when the banks were finished, which was done on the sudden, both by the multitude of hands and by their being accustomed to such work, they brought the machines. But Charis and Joseph, who were the most potent men in the city, set their armed men in order, though already in a fright, because they did not suppose that the city could hold out long, since they had not a sufficient quantity either of water or of other necessaries. However, these their leaders encouraged them, and brought them out upon the wall, and for a while indeed they drove away those that were bringing the machines. But when those machines threw darts and stones at them, they retired into the city. Then did the Romans bring battering rams to three several places, and made the wall shake and fall. They then poured in over the parts of the wall that were thrown down, with a mighty sound of trumpets and noise of armor, and with a shout of the soldiers, and break in by force upon those that were in the city. But these men fell upon the Romans for some time, at their first entrance, and prevented their going any further, and with great courage beat them back. And the Romans were so overpowered by the greater multitude of the people, who beat them on every side, that they were obliged to run into the upper parts of the city. Whereupon the people turned about, and fell upon their enemies, who had attacked them, and thrust them down to the lower parts, and as they were distressed by the narrowness and difficulty of the place, slew them. And as these Romans could neither beat those back that were above them, nor escape the force of their own men that were forcing their way forward, they were compelled to fly into their enemies' houses, which were low. But these houses being thus full of soldiers, whose weight they could not bear, fell down suddenly. And when one house fell, it shook down a great many of those that were under it, as did those do to such as were under them. By this means a vast number of the Romans perished, for they were so terribly distressed, that although they saw the houses subsiding, they were compelled to leap upon the tops of them, so that a great many were ground to powder by these ruins, and a great many of those that got out from under them lost some of their limbs, but still a greater number were suffocated by the dust that arose from those ruins. The people of Gamala supposed this to be an assistance afforded them by God, and without regarding what damage they suffered themselves, they pressed forward and thrust the enemy upon the tops of their houses, and when they stumbled in the sharp and narrow streets, and were perpetually falling down, they threw their stones or darts at them and slew them. Now the very ruins afforded them stones enough, and for iron weapons the dead men of the enemy's side afforded them what they wanted. For drawing the swords of those that were dead, they made use of them to dispatch such as were only half dead. Nay, there were a great number who, upon their falling down from the tops of the houses, stabbed themselves and died after that manner. Nor indeed was it easy for those who were beaten back to fly away, for they were so unacquainted with the ways, and the dust was so thick, that they wandered about without knowing one another, and fell down dead among the crowd. 5. Those therefore that were able to find their ways out of the city retired. But now Vespasian always stayed among those that were hard set, for he was deeply affected with seeing the ruins of the city falling upon his army, and forgot to take care of his own preservation. He went up gradually towards the highest parts of the city before he was aware, and was left in the midst of dangers, having only a very few with him, for even his son Titus was not with him at that time, having been then sent to Syria to Musianus. However, he thought it not safe to fly, nor did he esteem it a fit thing for him to do. But calling to mind the actions he had done from his youth, and recollecting his courage, as if he had been excited by a divine fury, he covered himself and those that were with him with their shields, and formed a testudo over both their bodies and their armor, and bore up against the enemy's attacks, who came running down from the top of the city. And without showing any dread at the multitude of the men or of their darts, he endured all, until the enemy took notice of that divine courage that was within him, and remitted of their attacks. And when they pressed less zealously upon him, he retired, 
though without showing his back to them till he was gotten out of the walls of the city. Now a great number of the Romans fell in this battle, among whom was Abudius, the Decurian, a man who appeared not only in this engagement wherein he fell, but everywhere, and in former engagements, to be of the truest courage, and one that had done very great mischief to the Jews. But there was a centurion whose name was Gallus, who, during this disorder, being encompassed about, he and ten other soldiers privately crept into the house of a certain person, where he heard them talking at supper what the people intended to do against the Romans or about themselves, for both the man himself and those with him were Syrians. So he got up in the night time, and cut all their throats, and escaped, together with his soldiers, to the Romans. 6. And now Vespasian comforted his army, which was much dejected by reflecting on their ill success, and because they had never before fallen into such a calamity, and besides this, because they were greatly ashamed that they had left their general alone in great dangers. As to what concerned himself, he avoided to say anything, that he might by no means seem to complain of it. But he said that, quote, We ought to bear manfully what usually falls out in war, and this, by considering what the nature of war is, and how it can never be that we must conquer without bloodshed on our own side. For there stands about us that fortune which is of its own nature mutable, that while they had killed so many ten thousands of the Jews, they had now paid their small share of the reckoning to fate. And as it is the part of weak people to be too much puffed up with good success, so is it the part of cowards to be too much affrighted at that which is ill. For the change from one to the other is sudden on both sides. And he is the best warrior who is of a sober mind under misfortunes, that he may continue in that temper, and cheerfully recover what had been lost formerly. And as for what had now happened, it was neither owing to their own effeminacy, nor to the valor of the Jews, but the difficulty of the place was the occasion of their advantage, and of our disappointment. Upon reflecting on which matter, one might blame your zeal as perfectly ungovernable, for when the enemy had retired to their highest fastnesses, you ought to have restrained yourselves, and not, by presenting yourselves at the top of the city, to be exposed to dangers. But upon your having obtained the lower parts of the city, you ought to have provoked those that had retired thither to a safe and settled battle. Whereas, in rushing so hastily upon victory, you took no care of your safety. But this incautiousness in war, and this madness of zeal, is not a Roman maxim. While we perform all that we attempt by skill and good order, that procedure is the part of barbarians, and is what the Jews chiefly support themselves by. We ought therefore to return to our own virtue, and to be rather angry than any longer dejected at this unlucky misfortune, and let every one seek for his own consolation from his own hand. For by this means he will avenge those that have been destroyed, and punish those that have killed them. For myself I will endeavor, as I have now done, to go first before you against your enemies in every engagement, and to be the last that retires from it. End quote. 7. So Vespasian encouraged his army by this speech, but for the people of Gamala it happened that they took courage for a little while upon such great and unaccountable successes as they had had. But when they considered with themselves that they had now no hopes of any terms of accommodation, and reflecting upon it that they could not get away, and that their provisions began already to be short, they were exceedingly cast down, and their courage failed them. Yet did they not neglect what might be for their preservation, so far as they were able, but the most courageous among them guarded those parts of the wall that were beaten down, while the more infirm did the same to the rest of the wall that still remained round the city. And as the Romans raised their banks, and attempted to get into the city a second time, a great many of them fled out of the city through impracticable valleys, where no guards were placed, as also through subterraneous caverns, while those that were afraid of being caught, and for that reason stayed in the city, perished for want of food, for what food they had was brought together from all quarters, and reserved for the fighting men. 8. And these were the hard circumstances that the people of Gamala were in. But now Vespasian went about other work by the by during the siege, and that was to subdue those that had seized upon Mount Tabor, a place that lies in the middle between the great plain and Scythopolis, whose top is elevated as high as thirty furlongs, 
and is hardly to be ascended on its north side. Its top is a plain of twenty-six furlongs, and all encompassed with a wall. Footnote. These numbers in Josephus, of thirty furlongs ascent to the top of Mount Tabor, whether we estimate it by winding and gradual, or by the perpendicular altitude, and of twenty-six furlong circumference upon the top, as also fifteen furlongs for this ascent in Polybius, with, with Geminus's perpendicular altitude of almost fourteen furlongs, here noted by Dr. Hudson, do none of them agree with the authentic testimony of Mr. Mondrell, an eyewitness, who says that he was not an hour in getting up to the top of this Mount Tabor, and that the area of the top is an oval of about two furlongs in length, and one in breadth. So I rather suppose Josephus wrote three furlongs for the ascent or altitude instead of thirty, and six furlongs for the circumference at the top instead of twenty-six, since a mountain of only three furlongs perpendicular altitude may easily require near an hour's ascent, and the circumference of an oval of the foregoing quantity is near six furlongs. Nor certainly could such a vast circumference as twenty-six furlongs, or three miles and a quarter, at that height, be encompassed with a wall, including a trench and other fortifications, perhaps those still remaining, in the small interval of forty days, as Josephus here says they were by himself. And footnote. Now Josephus erected this so long a wall in forty days' time, and furnished it with other materials, and with water from below, for the inhabitants only made use of rain-water. As therefore there was a great multitude of people gotten together upon this mountain, Vespasian sent Placidus with six hundred horsemen thither. Now, as it was impossible for him to ascend the mountain, he invited many of them to peace, by the offer of his right hand for their security, and of his intercession for them. Accordingly they came down, but with a treacherous design, as well as he had the like treacherous design upon them on the other side. For Placidus spoke mildly to them, as aiming to take them, when he got them into the plain. They also came down, as complying with his proposals, but it was in order to fall upon him when he was not aware of it. However, Placidus's stratagem was too hard for theirs, for when the Jews began to fight, he pretended to run away, and when they were in pursuit of the Romans, he enticed them a great way along the plain, and then made his horsemen turn back, whereupon he beat them, and slew a great number of them, and cut off the retreat of the rest of the multitude, and hindered their return. So they left Tabor, and fled to Jerusalem, while the people of the country came to terms with him, for their water failed them, and so they delivered up the mountain and themselves to Placidus. 9. But of the people of Gamala, those that were of the bolder sort fled away and hid themselves, while the more infirm perished by famine. But the men of war sustained the siege till the two and twentieth day of the month Hyperbaritans, Tisri, when three soldiers of the fifteenth legion, about the morning watch, got under a high tower that was near them and undermined it, without making any noise. Nor when they either came to it, which was in the night time, nor when they were under it, did those that guarded it perceive them. These soldiers then upon their coming avoided making a noise, and when they had rolled away five of its strongest stones, they went away hastily, whereupon the tower fell down on a sudden, with a very great noise, and its guard fell headlong with it, so that those that kept guard at other places were under such disturbance that they ran away. The Romans also slew many of those that ventured to oppose them, among whom was Joseph, who was slain by a dart, as he was running away over that part of the wall that was broken down, but as those that were in the city were greatly affrighted at the noise, they ran hither and thither, and a great consternation fell upon them, as though all the enemy had fallen in at once upon them. Then it was that Charis, who was ill and under the physician's hands, gave up the ghost, the fear that he was in greatly contributing to make his distemper fatal to him. But the Romans so well remembered their former ill success, that they did not enter the city till the three-and-twentieth day of the forementioned month. 10. At which time Titus, who was now returned, out of the indignation he had at the destruction the Romans had undergone while he was absent, took two hundred chosen horsemen and some footmen with him, and entered without noise into the city. Now as the watch perceived that he was coming, they made a noise, and betook themselves to their arms. And as that his entrance was presently known to those that were in the city, some of them caught hold of their children and their wives, and drew them after them, 
and fled away to the citadel with lamentations and cries, while others of them went to meet Titus and were killed perpetually. But so many of them as were hindered from running up to the citadel, not knowing what in the world to do, fell among the Roman guards, while the groans of those that were killed were prodigiously great everywhere, and blood ran down all over the lower parts of the city from the upper. But then Vespasian himself came to his assistance against those that had fled to the citadel, and brought his whole army with him. Now this upper part of the city was every way rocky and difficult of ascent, and elevated to a vast altitude, and very full of people on all sides, and encompassed with precipices, whereby the Jews cut off those that came up to them, and did much mischief to others by their darts, and the large stones which they rolled down upon them, while they were themselves so high that the enemy's darts could hardly reach them. However, there arose such a divine storm against them as was instrumental to their destruction. This carried the Roman darts upon them, and made those which they threw turn back, and drove them obliquely away from them. Nor could the Jews indeed stand upon their precipices by reason of the violence of the wind, having nothing that was stable to stand upon, nor could they see those that were ascending up to them. So the Romans got up and surrounded them, and some they slew before they could defend themselves, and others as they were delivering up themselves. And the remembrance of those that were slain at their former entrance into the city increased their rage against them now. A great number also of those who were surrounded on every side, and despaired of escaping, threw their children and their wives, and themselves also, down the precipices, into the valley beneath, which, near the citadel, had been dug hollow to a vast depth but so it happened that the anger of the Romans appeared not to be so extravagant as was the madness of those that were now taken, while the Romans slew but four thousand, whereas the number of those that had thrown themselves down was found to be five thousand. Nor did any one escape except two women, who were the daughters of Philip, and Philip himself was the son of a certain eminent man called Jacobus, who had been general of King Agrippa's army and these did therefore escape, because they lay concealed from the rage of the Romans when the city was taken, for otherwise they spared not so much as the infants, of which many were flung down by them from the citadel. And thus was Gamala taken on the three-and-twentieth day of the month Hyperberitans, Tisri, whereas the city had first revolted on the four-and-twentieth day of the month Gorpeus, Elul. End of Book 4, Chapter 1